Is the war in Ukraine part of the great collapse before the great reset? The globalists have been planning to stage a great collapse as a prerequisite for what they call the great reset, what we could call the great revolution. With rising resistance to the dragged out pandemic, plandemic, scamdemic, panic propaganda, the military conflict in Ukraine is being presented by corporate media's unprovoked Russian aggression. And if you ask almost anyone anywhere, uh, what's the story? Vladimir Putin's gone mad. He's another Hitler. He's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. He's just on Russian expansionism. He's threatening everybody. He's going to try and take over the whole of Europe. Uh, this is just a, a very one-dimensional story. There's no depth, no context, no history. And there's no two sides about it. There's only one side. One side's totally right, paragon of virtue and democracy, and the other side is just demonic evil and so on. That's what's being presented in the mass media. But Zechariah 8 verse 16 tells us, these are the things you should do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. From the Russian perspective, and it's no good just thinking about the chessboard from your side of the game. You've got to understand, well, what do the other side say? And it's no good just listening to narrative, talking points, propaganda. If we believe our own propaganda, we're not going to understand the other side well, are we? So it's important to understand, well, what do the Russians say? What's their perspective? Well, to them, it's actually a logical reaction to deliberate provocation by the Biden at Obama administrations. Biden's administration has created this crisis to deflect attention from serious political failures at home, serious, catastrophic, disastrous failures at home, and to create a scapegoat for the great collapse which the New World Order is so committed to. Now, President Biden this week gave <coughs> the first State of the Nation of Ukraine address, and nothing really much about America, overwhelmingly about Ukraine, um, but he is meant to be giving a speech about the state of the United, of the United States, which is actually quite a dismal state. Uh, he's only done catastrophic, disastrous things since he got to power, not least of which was the catastrophic abandonment of Afghanistan in such a catastrophic way that they left thousands of Americans and green card American uh, holders behind in Afghanistan, and they left over $80 billion of high-tech weaponry behind. Now, bear in mind that Russia's total military budget for the year is only about $51 billion only. So America left more than the total annual budget of the Russian Federation Defense Force, all arms, in Afghanistan. So the Taliban are now the best equipped, best armed uh, terrorists on the planet, courtesy of Biden. But anyway, instead of dealing not one word about Afghanistan in the State of the Nation address, arguably one of the worst foreign policy disasters of the last few years in American history, but he just gave a whole lot of raw raw. Um, about Ukraine. Now, The Great Reset is not a theory. It's the title of a book, COVID-19, The Great Reset, by Klaus Schwab, founder and head of the World Economic Forum. And the book articulates how the United Nations Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 will reset the world. According to these globalists pushing what they call the Great Reset, in the future, you will own absolutely nothing, and you will be happy. The Great Reset aims to fundamentally re-engineer industries, societies, education, agriculture, relationships, even human beings, what they call the Fourth Industrial Revolution, transhumanism. You could call the Great Reset the Great Revolution. Its goal is ultimately a global welfare state where everybody will be dependent upon the global state for everything. Now, we had a whole presentation that in the past. You can look that up. It's on our web if you weren't there. Uh, this Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 will necessitate the abolition of faith, families, and nations. You could turn to Revelation 13, get a bit of an insight what they're after. They're after a one-world government with a one-world economy and a one-world interfaith religion, which is why we must be fighting against this. In a word, it's communism. We need to smash global communism. But enough of the Great Reset. Let's get back to the great collapse they're working on right now. The immediate cause of this crisis was Biden's sudden, arbitrary, unilateral push to integrate Ukraine into NATO 
placing anti-Russian armaments close to the Russian border. And by the way, do you know that in January, Vladimir Putin asked President Biden for a guarantee that America would not put nuclear missiles in Ukraine. And Biden flat refused to give such a guarantee. And in February, he asked for a meeting with, with President Biden, and Biden refused. So, you know, this totally unprovoked and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a little bit of context that's missing on the CNN, BBC narratives. This has been the political, geographic, and diplomatic equivalent of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. When the Soviet Union attempted to establish military bases in Cuba that could threaten America, and America immediately called on the Monroe Doctrine, which for almost two centuries has governed American policies, that no European powers are allowed to interfere in the Western Hemisphere, meaning North and South America and Central America. Cuba, of course, was in Central America. So the Monroe Doctrine has guided a lot of American foreign policy, and they take it very seriously. In fact, just recently, President Trump in 2018 said the Monroe Doctrine is as relevant today as it ever was. Well, the Cuban Missile Crisis 1962 was the Soviet Union, at the height of the Cold War, was placing missile bases inside Cuba, which is only a few hundred kilometers from America. And so this led to what they call 13 days in October, where the world was at the closest brink of nuclear war ever, although right now we're heading towards that too. Russia's now on DEFCON 2, which is just one step from actual nuclear war. That's the highest state of alert you can be without being actually engaged in war. DEFCON 1 means the missiles are in the air, basically. So this is the most serious nuclear warfare threat in my lifetime. And they say, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, there's never been another time when we've been closer to nuclear war. Cuban Missile Crisis, this is now similar, but on the other side. Ukraine has been used and abused like a political football by the US State Department for very nefarious New World Order objectives. Do not be deluded into thinking that Ukraine is some golden democracy. They came to power through a coup that overthrew the elected government, with American aid, of course. They, the present government, which is winning the propaganda war very well, uh, in fact, they're doing outstandingly, but their president is an ex-comedian who was an actor who, amongst other things, uh, acted being a history teacher who became president of Ukraine and walked into the Ukraine parliament with Uzi submachine guns and machine gunned everybody. This is in the film. And people thought this is such a great idea that they elected this actor, comedian, to being the president of Ukraine, which is a bit bizarre, but he's a darn good actor. I mean, this is a role of a lifetime, and he's doing a superb job in mobilizing public opinion and support for the Ukraine cause. But one should just say that he locks up his opponents, political opponents, journalists have been locked up in Ukraine. Ukraine is not exactly a model democracy. In fact, it's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. I think it it lists something like fourth from the bottom in terms of corruption stakes in the world. It's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Ukraine did not ask for this chaos right now, and the European powers didn't even ask for it. And this is, this is the kind of material you get in the newspapers and magazines of today. It's just absolute warmongering garbage. Back in 2013, 2014, Germany strongly warned America of the potentially disastrous consequence of this policy of trying to absorb Ukraine into NATO. Ukraine is not just in Russia's backyard. Um, it is actually so integrated and it's so close. The distance between Kiev and Moscow is the distance between the Cape Town and the Orange River if we're driving up the N1 and we want to, about the distance from Cape Town to Colesburg. That's how close Minsk is from Moscow. Proverbs 26 verse 17 warns us, he who passes by medals in a quarrel not his own is like one who seizes a dog by the ears. Not intelligent. You grab a dog by the ears, you get bitten in the face. Germany also invested 11 billion euro. Euros are, what, something like 17 or 18 rand to the euro right now, so that's a lot of money into the natural gas pipeline with Russia. I think Germany's depend for something in the region of 60% of their natural gas requirements for energy coming from Russia right now. 
Some even suggest that stopping this Nord Stream 2 pipeline has been the primary objective of the Biden administration, which is one of the most corrupt administrations in American history too. To avoid the influence of Russia, the economic influence of Russia increasing at American expense at the moment, Europe, Western Europe is overwhelmingly dependent on America economically, but at the moment it's getting to a tipping point where Europe could be more dependent on Russia economically. And would the American government risk a war for purely economic ends? Yes, they've done so frequently. Setting up Russia and backing them into a strategic corner to essentially have no choice but to respond militarily was precisely what Biden and Obama and Clinton, by that I mean Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State at that time, what they achieved in 2014. Remember, Biden was the Vice President of Obama in 2014, and they sponsored and encouraged the violent mob violence in the streets of Kiev, in which hundreds of people died. This was a very, they called it the Maiden Revolution, they called it the Color Revolution, the Orange Revolution, Revolution of Human Dignity, but it was pretty bad. You know, when the police are throwing Molotov cocktails as well, it's, it's deteriorated to a hideous way. Now, this is the kind of nice picture of the Maiden Revolution, which shows, yay, Freedom Square all filled and so on. And these are some obviously photo ops which were set up. I mean, how's this for choreographed photography? This is, this is uh, what you call a propaganda event. They've, they've just, this is staged photo. Is this ever staged? These are the kind of photos that they were sending around the world to give you the impression, I mean, have you ever seen something so staged? Even the color of the piano, it's in the Ukrainian national colors. This is all part of the US government funded, sponsored, orchestrated revolution that brought down the elected president of Ukraine, who was a fr personal friend and, of Putin and an ally of Russia. And this color revolution removed Ukraine's elected pro-Russian president, the man on the left, with a client of the US State Department, the man on the right. They might look very similar to you, but they are different individuals. <laughs> Who rejected the economic alliance with Russia in favor of integrating with the European Union and NATO. And Russia was offering them a really good deal, but apparently a lot of money was swapping hands. This Ukraine administration has been as corrupt as it comes from the beginning in 2014. NATO has expanded from 12 member countries to 30 member countries. And NATO is one big colossal money-making industry because by law of NATO, if you're a member of NATO, you must spend at least 2% of your gross domestic product on almonds. And if you're NATO, there's certain almonds you've got to get and they've got to be integratable and therefore Who's producing most of these almonds? Well, the United States, America, military industrial arms complex. And so this is a phenomenal amount of money that's coming in from the more countries get joined to NATO, the more weapons they sell. Proverbs 20 verse 3 says, It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. That 2014 coup in Ukraine, and I mean, can you just think, doesn't matter how well you kit it out in right gear, a petrol bomb with liquid explosive fire going over. I mean, this is hideous. And, you know, the burns that come from it. I wasn't a fire brigade. Let me tell you, this is not nice. Especially as it threatened Russian interest in the Crimean Peninsula. Now, bear in mind, uh, Crimea is the only warm water port for the Russian Navy. In fact, the Sevastopol naval base is the geopolitical equivalent of, of if Russia had seized the United States Pacific Ocean naval base in San Diego away from the US. Well, America could never accept that. San Diego is the most important naval base that America's got, and that's, uh, that's on the Pacific Ocean coast. And of course, America's got lots of ice free ports. Russia only has one, really. And putting American missiles in Ukraine would be a equivalent of Russia putting missiles in Cuba. And Russia's been making clear for 15 years, since 20, uh, 2008, 20, uh, 2008, America announced that they were going to admit Ukraine into NATO. And since then, Vladimir Putin has been saying, yet, and yet means yet. But they've ignored him. 
So to protect Russia's strategic national interest, Putin had no choice but to reclaim the territory, Crimea, which had been Russian since it was liberated from the Ottoman Turkish Empire in the 1700s. And the population voted overwhelmingly to support this in a referendum. Now, I was in America in 2014, and I was speaking at very pro-American patriotic groups, conservative groups, like the Tea Party. Tea Party stand, stood for Taxed Enough Already, which was the major movement of um, opposing Obama. And at these tea parties, I'd have Americans come and say, don't you agree we should bomb Russia and reclaim Crimea and all this? And I said, no. Russia's had Crimea longer than you've had California and Texas. In fact, most of America. In fact, before uh, just about the whole of the West was American, Crimea was already Russian. They liberate from the Ottoman Turks. 95% of the population there is Russian. It's demographically, linguistically, culturally Russian, and have just voted to stay in Russia. So why would you want to force a war over Russia taking back what's already theirs? Bear in mind, this middle part is what was historically Crimea, um, Ukraine. And in fact, if you look at the dark part in the middle, that's what Ukraine was in 1654. But in 1922, Vladimir Lenin, not known for being a Democrat, uh, he annexed that vast amount of eastern and southern Russia into Ukraine. And Nikita Khrushchev, who was also a Ukrainian, uh, he annexed uh, the whole of Crimea into Ukraine back in 1954. And Joseph Stalin took a whole bunch of the far west and just annexed it into Ukraine too. Now, none of this was done with referendums, without regard to demographics or linguistics or anything like that. So Ukraine is something of an empire much like South Africa in the sense that colonial powers added and subtracted at will and none of us had a say in the matter. Nobody had a referendum in South Africa in 1910, for example, as to whether to join the Union. It was just done by the Brits who had just brutally crushed the Transvaal and the Free State and the Anglo-Boer War. Well, this is somewhat similar. A lot of Ukraine was just summarily added to by dictators. And uh, we need to bear in mind that that's not the way things should be decided. So the vast majority of the population in Crimea was ethnically, linguistically, culturally Russian and still are, and these are just some of the most important naval bases in Russia's uh, entire geographic area. And Russia therefore re-seized Crimea. In fact, they didn't have to invade it because they already had it. It, it was Russian, simple. Uh, and the difference was that Ukraine before let Russia lease those areas but after the coup in 2014 and an anti-Russian president was installed by the Americans, then Russia said, well, we'll just keep it, thank you. And then they formally annexed it after a referendum. So that is not recognized worldwide at this stage, uh, but bear in mind that, uh, and these are famous places. Balaclava should, and Sevastopol should remind people of charge of the Light Brigade, 1850s, Florence Nightingale, all of that. So the Russian Navy is deeply, embedded in Crimea. Uh, by the way, notice the St. George's cross flag is the, is the naval flag of Russia today. And so they have no intention of giving up the Crimea and they would fight for it, of course. And so this is just showing at that stage um, in 2014, the forces arrayed and Russia had no intention whatsoever of moving. The, these are the kind of um, What's CNN put up? Russian invasion of uh, the Crimean Peninsula. Well, the invasion of the Crimean Peninsula actually happened back in 1780s. Barack Obama, who came to hate Putin for opposing his LGBTQ agenda because Putin banned gay propaganda for children in Russia in 2013. Now, when you had Obama pushing heavily for the LGBTQ, um, Putin said, does not Russian, does not Christian, we won't accept it. And so at one stage, you actually had these sort of characters who could be carrying on uh, in Red Square. Well, Putin soon put a stop to that. You won't see people doing this for very long in Russia these days. They'll get arrested pretty quick. But now a whole campaign has developed to the extent that there are now books out on a campaign of hating Russia and gay propaganda. Because that's what's going on right now. Is Russia is being hated today, not because they used to be communist, not because Putin used to be a KGB agent, but because they are now Christian and not communist, and anti the gay agenda. And Vladimir Putin is 
supremely popular in Russia. Whether everyone supports him in this particular war right now is another matter. It's too early to tell that. But Barack Obama set up a series of provocative and threatening events like a row of dominoes so as to be able to accuse Russia of aggression. You know, it's just like someone who provokes you, provokes you, provokes you, pushes you, pushes you, pushes you. At a certain point, you hit back, and next thing, they're the victim, and you get into trouble with the principal. You know, it's that sort of typical thing that you get these people who just provoke and provoke and goad. And when you react, it's your fault. 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. That Russian military aggression could then be used to restart the Cold War and justify US military intervention in Ukraine as a pretext for plundering. Make no mistake, Ukraine is being plundered. And there's a lot of corruption taking place and American hands are full of it in the Biden family more than most. This initiated a campaign of mafia-style piracy, a protection racket on a national scale, headed by Joe Biden as the godfather and his son Hunter serving as his in-country enforcer. And this is incredibly corrupt. So take Hunter Biden, who earned $156 million, according to just this report, from Ukraine corruption. He was getting millions of dollars for a no-show job. How would you like a job like that? You get paid millions of dollars, but don't have to show up at work. And how could he do that? Is it because he's supremely talented? No, he is just the son of what was then the vice president, now the president. And so he was on the board of this Ukrainian oil company. So Hunter Biden at age 49 joins the board of Burisma, Burisma Holdings, Ukrainian natural gas company. This is in 2014. Oh, what a coincidence. That's the very year that uh, America staged a coup there. What a coincidence. Well, the owner of Burisma Holdings, Mykola Zolokovensky is under investigation for channeling government contracts to his business while he is ecology minister. <laughs> um, and so Viktor Shonkin uh, was the prosecutor general between 2015 and 2016. And Joe Biden forced the Kiev government to sack their prosecutor general because he was investigating the company that his son was a board member of. And so you can actually see this video, it's out there, where at a meeting in the Council of Foreign Relations, 23rd of January, 2018, Vi uh, Biden, who was the previous vice president, said, boasts, I said, you're not getting the billion dollars I'm leaving here in six hours, and if the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. And then he, in his quote, says, well, SOB, would you know it? They fired him within the hour. And the whole audience burst out laughter. Now, here's a man who was vice president of America at the time, laughing about how he got a sovereign, independent democracy to fire their prosecutor general, like the attorney general, for trying to investigate his son's corrupt dealings in that country. I mean, the whole thing is just disgusting. And uh, a lot of people know this, these sort of cartoons have been out for a long time. When you talk about the swamp, Washington deep state swamp, Biden is a long time, typical corrupt career politician who's never had a principle. And he and his son are really incredibly corrupt. I mean, to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars. And you can be sure the people in Ukraine are not getting much of this. They poor. Most of the people in Ukraine are suffering. But there's a lot of people in DC who've gotten super rich on this. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19 could be written over a lot of governments. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption and depravity. The more you look into Hunter Biden's missing laptop and all that, who wants to go there? So this is the capital of Ukraine, Kiev, or Kiev, depending how you pronounce it. And this is what democracy looks like. This is the result of the orange color maiden revolution uh, coup in 2014. As a direct consequence of the Obama-sponsored Orange Revolution coup, whatever you want to call it, one of the first things they did, February 2014 already, was they abolished the minority language rights in Ukraine. Now, just notice, the Ukrainian language is the majority where you see the yellows, and the red is where Russian is the majority language, and then you see the brown spots where both are spoken. And there's other minority languages like Polish and Romanian and so on. So 
cancelling minority language rights, which affected the Russians the most, was not the most intelligent thing to do. Here you can see a less complicated, just showing uh, between Russian and Ukrainian. So the more blue, the more Russian, the more green, the more Ukrainian. And uh, you can see that obviously eastern and southern Ukraine is very Russian. Western Ukraine is more Ukrainian, which fits with the historic position. And so by the new unelected government that's been brought in by the Orange Revolution in February 2014, they abolished not only minority language rights, uh, but also autonomy for those areas with an overwhelmingly Russian majority, such as Donetsk. Here's Donetsk and uh, Luhansk. And so both of them declared independence from Ukraine. Well, wouldn't you under the same circumstance? And so Luhansk and Donetsk are in the extreme east of the country and overwhelmingly Russian majority as a 90-95% population of Russian. So they declared independence and this triggered a civil war which led to a ceasefire by August 2014 and was brutal. A lot of people died. Shelling, rocketing, air attacks on civilians in this separatist area and um, it was so hideous, something in the region of 15,000 civilians were killed by the Ukrainian forces to try and stop these people from seceding. And I've got letters from good Christian reformed missionary friends of mine who have given me direct from uh, their relatives in eastern Ukraine the stories of how the Ukrainians were targeting, bombing, murdering civilians in the Donbass region in Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, during 2014, 2015 in particular. And you know, nobody seemed to care. Nobody cared because they weren't worthy victims. They were like white South Africans or white farmers. Who cares? And so you could murder Eastern Ukrainians because they're Russian, so it's fine. And that was the kind of attitude in the media. So nobody has particularly... Now they're concerned about Ukrainians dying in 2022, but apparently Ukrainians dying in 2014 was not newsworthy. Here are some Ukrainian prisoners captured by the separatists, the secessionists in eastern Ukraine being uh, paraded through the streets. They were later released and allowed to go back to, to um, Ukraine. But they were, first of all, um, to show we've captured these Ukrainian regulars and then released them. And of course, in these Donbass regions, the eastern regions of Ukraine, the people fly the Russian flag enthusiastically because they see Russia as Mother Russia and their savior and their protector from the Ukrainians who hate them and want to kill them, ethnic cleansing and so on. So these are some of the separatists in eastern Ukraine. Very serious. And they've got a Russian flag up there and they're armed and they're ready. And uh, these are the people who've been fighting for the independence since 2014. And so the boundaries were recognized early in 2015 in the Treaty of Minsk, where basically it was agreed to leave it at that. And they, but it didn't last long. Regularly, there's been artillery attacks, rocket attacks, and even aerial strikes from Ukrainian forces against the people in what they call the separatist regions, or what Donetsk and Lugansk are calling uh, independent se secessionist areas. So earlier this year, when President Biden of America rejected Russia's demand for a promise that Ukraine would not become a base for anti-Russian nuclear missiles, Putin's predictable decision was to formally recognize Donetsk and Luhansk as independent countries and enter into mutual defense agreements. That, from the Russian perspective, justified the current military incursion to these two states. And by the way, on Russian TV, they are not calling it a war, they're not calling it invasion, they're calling it a military operation, they're calling it a specific targeted operation, and uh, they claim to have limited goals, temporary goals, they're trying to establish the security of Russians in Ukraine and they want to withdraw as soon as they've established that. That's what they stated. As to the truth of all sides, I have no idea. We're just reporting what's being said. We all know the other side. So according to the Russians, their military incursion into these two states was to attack the attackers who were attacking the people that they now have a defense agreement with. These states that they recognize as independent, which by self-determination have voted to be independent and who want support from Russia, and so when the Ukrainians continue to rocket and to strafe and to send an artillery strikes on people in the Donbass region, then Russia counterattacked. 
So geographically, Donetsk borders with Russia and has a stretch of coastline on the Sea of Azov. Now, Azov is the sea that's formed between Russia and the Crimean Peninsula. So you've got the Black Sea, you've got the Sea of Azov. So they have access to the uh, Black Sea and they're very close to Crimea. So Luhansk is immediately to the north of Donetsk and it also borders with Russia. These two states now form a friendly buffer zone for Russia between itself and the United States controlled Ukraine. That's the way they see it. So the Putin strategy they point out is similar to what America has done in the Balkans and other places and is comparable to similar US actions. So when this wave of outrage against Russia bombing targets in Ukraine, um, these posters were being sent all over saying, um, democracy world tour, US bombing list, countries that America's bombs in the second world war. And it's, it's actually quite a long list and it's quite tragic. I mean, bear in mind, we're not just talking about hundreds of thousands of people who've died in the bombings listed here, but millions of people have been killed. This, this is not small. Just think of the bombings of Iraq. Think of the huge amount of devastation caused in Libya and in Syria, for example, and uh, a lot of damage done. Can anyone tell me which city this is being bombed here? No. Another guess? Which city? Same city. It's the capital of Serbia. Belgrade. That was the bombings of Belgrade, bombings of Yugoslavia, March to June 1999, done by America and NATO. British and French were part of it too. And Serbia leached, launched a legal case against NATO over the 1999 bombings. Now, notice RT, this is Russia Today television. Um, and this is the bombing of NATO, so uh, by NATO, of a European city. So when the news headlines in Slime Magazine and Communist News Network and the Bolshevik Broadcasting Corporation come out, this is the first bombing of any city in Europe since the Second World War. No, <laughs> not even close. Um, we won't even talk about... Uh, Budapest back in 1956 and so on. We won't talk about Prague in 1968. But how about Serbia, Belgrade, by nature in 1999? How can they just ignore all that history? But, you know, who cares about facts? Uh, we've got a narrative to spin here. And then you've got these people saying, but there's no threat from NATO. NATO's only defensive. To which Russia today says, well, what about NATO's invasion and occupation of Afghanistan for 20 years. What's that got to do with Europe? That's pretty far from the North Atlantic. And, and look at all these different countries that were involved in Afghanistan and what did they actually achieve? Afghanistan's worse off now than it was before, except they've got a lot more weapons. Uh, they've left $85 billion of the best high-tech weaponry in the hands of the Taliban terrorists, so they're now the very best armed terrorists in the world. And how many trillions of dollars were pumped in and how many hundreds of thousands of people died for what? And this was orchestrated by? Well, what about the bombing of Libya, which had one of the highest standards of living in, well, in the whole of Africa for sure, uh, and now it's one of the worst. And the British and French and American NATO forces bombed and bombed and bombed round the clock and leveled so much of Libya and created a tsunami of millions of African refugees who've been pouring into Europe ever since as a result of the destabilizing of the whole of North Africa and the Middle East by America under Obama and Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. So NATO's a defensive alliance. That's why NATO bombed Serbia, invaded Afghanistan, and destroyed Libya. And then they start looking at numbers of airstrikes. Look at this down here. Kosovo. 19,484 airstrikes. That's 250 airstrikes a day. Afghanistan, only 6,500 airstrikes, only 83 airstrikes a day. Libya, 2011, was only 9,700 airstrikes. 43 airstrikes a day. Iraq and Syria, 2,796 airstrikes. That's down to just 10 airstrikes a day. Now, you just think when our country was getting a car bomb, like Church Street bombing and so on, we were all horrified. A car bomb. I mean, that's terrorism. Putting a, a car bomb to explode in a church like Church Street, 1983. Okay, now think of airstrike on a civilian center. 
Okay, this isn't quite like the Second World War when the RAF and USAAF came over whole cities like Dresden and Hamburg and Cologne and Berlin and Dresden just flattened them with tens of thousands of tons of high explosive and incendiary bombs, flattening whole suburbs, inner cities, killing hundreds of thousands of people in a night, such as in Dresden. But still, there's a lot of civilians dying in these bombings. So forgive some of us for being super cynical at all this outrage over <gasps> Russia's bombing Kiev. Well, it's more precision than some of the things these characters have done. There's not as many civilian casualties. It's a tragedy. It's a human tragedy. It's a war that shouldn't be taking place. It should end as quick as possible. Any loss of life, and especially civilian life, is to be condemned. But where's this moral superiority coming from? Does the West, does NATO, does the United States of America really have the moral grounds to condemn what Russia's doing when they've done vastly worse in the last 30 years? By the way, the number of countries being bombed by the US under Barack Hussein Obama, who got an, a peace, a Nobel Peace Prize, by the way. I don't know what he got it for. He bombed seven countries. I don't know. In the past, you got peace awards for doing something for peace, but bombing things to peace is something else. And by the way, and these are just some of the wars that uh, American presidents that are now alive have accumulated. And this is not, a, it's interesting that President Trump is the only American president since Herbert Hoover, which was before the Second World War, who didn't start a new war. Sadly, he did allow himself to get talked into sending some missiles into Syria, which is disgusting and ill-advised, but he didn't start a new war. He did continue some of the old wars, uh, although he's winding down Afghanistan and so on. But still, these presidents bombed how many countries? A lot more than Vladimir Putin has done. But Vladimir Putin is a thug, a war criminal. He's, uh, you know, etc., etc., for what he's doing in Ukraine. But these people are heroes, apparently, or Democrats or something. But, by the way, um, Putin's got expansionist tendencies. How many countries has he invaded? This, by the way, is where America has military bases. Bear in mind that America's first president, George Washington, before he left office in his farewell speech, said, avoid entangling alliances and never get involved in Europe's wars. So that was what the first president of America, George Washington, said in his farewell address. If only America had done that. But what can justify having bases in all these different countries? Now, with the world's attention now riveted on Ukraine, the United States media has begun blaming America's internal economic troubles, which long predates it, and all its failings on the Ukraine-Russian conflict. I mean, isn't it nice to have a war to blame? Even though they were just like the ANC government, blames now COVID lockdown, which they brought about, by the way, uh, for their chaos and failures in so many fronts. But it was like that before they came uh, into the lockdown. Nevertheless, the U.S. elites now have their distraction from their domestic disasters, and they have their scapegoat in the form of unprovoked Russian aggression. It is said that the first casualty in war is truth. In fact, it's like there's a firing squad lined up of the mass media to kill truth. And if you want to see what propaganda is like, just listen to the garbage on CNN and BBC. And I know it, and I've experienced this because I was brought up in Rhodesia, and I remember the one-sided garbage that they would put out about these evil, nasty, racist, white supremacist Rhodesians and all the evil things saying, the Rhodesian army is 85% black. And they were volunteers, by the way. And we were fighting communist aggression. And there were Cubans and Russians on the other side arming the terrorists. And the weapons came from the Soviet Union and from China. And, and we were being demonized like there was nothing justifiable. They had no problem. The communist terrorists could shoot down Rhodesian civilian airline, a Viscount, on internal flight, did it twice. And the first case killed cooked and ate the survivors. And there wasn't a word of condemnation, not from the Pope, not from the Archbishop of Canterbury, not from London, not from Washington, not from the UN. Nobody condemned. Why? Because they're Rhodesians. They're like Eastern Ukrainians. Like, they don't matter. It's like white South African farmers. 
they're not worthy victims, not worth even mentioning, because, you know, we don't like them anyway. They deserve to be murdered and tortured before they get murdered, by the way. So that was that. And same with us in Southwest Africa and fighting in Angola. The South African army apparently never once killed a terrorist. They only killed innocent refugees. And uh, you, know, the, you could attack these bases. And I remember Colonel Breitenbach uh, commenting on uh, how the paratroop attack of Smoke Shell in 1978 dropping in on the uh, headquarters of Swapo in Angola. And they were condemned uh, for this massacre of civilians. And he said, they were the best armed refugees I've ever seen. You know? 14.5 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, a ZU 23 millimeter multiple um, anti-aircraft weapons. I mean, they, they were all armed with the best of the best, Dragunovs and PKMs and RPGs and the whole lot. Uh, but according to the media, it's always one dimensional. So, you know, the people I hate, like South Africans, Rhodesians, in this case, Russians, they only kill women and children. They're only killing civilians. Um, like the police during the riots, they never shot a rioter a stone throw or petrol bomber. They only shot some poor innocent teenager who's on his way to the shop to buy milk whose grandmother says he'd never caused any trouble. I mean, this, this, this is propaganda. I mean, dead serious. This is the kind of junk they throw at you morning, noon, and night. And so, unfortunately, the first casualty in war is truth. Proverbs 12, verse 22 says, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. Have you noticed how much absolute garbage lies have already been debunked? I mean, the, the garbage they've come out with already, that's already been proven false, such as how the Russians killed all 13 of the Ukrainians defending Snake Island. Well, <laughs> problem is now they're on YouTube uh, giving messages to the mommy, and you can see them being cared for by the Russians, and they, they, they're all alive, not one of them's dead. Another one is... The ghost of Kiev, who owns the sky, who shot down myriads of Russian planes. And until somebody pointed out, but the face of this person's uh, a known actor, and the cockpit is not of a real plane. This is from some um, video game, and so on. <laughs> so, but, but these things have been spread through CNN, BBC. There's no end of lies. I mean, lies, lies, lies. So the, but this is typical. This is propaganda. This, this happened in the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. I mean, lies like this happen in the media. You just got to, you know, if you've lived long enough, you recognize it. But for people who, this is their first war, maybe, they might be thinking, oh, this is terrible. No. And, but garbage. Many politicians and journalists in America are beating the war drums and work up a patriotic fervor. Rally behind the president. Punish Vladimir Putin. Support Ukraine. Get us involved in the war. Well, by the way, punishing Putin, how are they punishing Putin? By punishing everybody who lives in Russia. What is the point at this stage of sending weapons to Ukraine to get more Ukrainians to die needlessly in a war that's already lost? What is the point in putting economic sanctions on Russia, which collapses the ruble by 30%, which makes everyone in Russia poorer, which makes people who have already been struggling even poorer, how is it putting people out of work is going to help? It's just like those people who are saying, sanction South Africa, disinvest from South Africa. Did that actually help? No. Just put millions of people out of work and a lot of people who were poor got poorer. And that's what happens. Sanctions is economic warfare. Sanctions are the modern equivalent of siege warfare. I mean, during a siege, they would blockade until the people starved to death. I mean, that's, and so sanctions are modern equivalent of siege warfare. Economic warfare is warfare. And one shouldn't think that, well, you know, we stay neutral while we're enforcing. What point is all of this doing? It's setting things up for the great collapse to prepare for a great reset. That's what's the benefit. Now, those who advocate caution or try to explain the complications in the context of the conflict will be branded unpatriotic traitors. Tucker Carlson's one of the few people trying to at least, uh, he still supports so much of what America is doing. Uh, but he's just trying to give some context and caution, and they're damning him to hell. I mean, he's an agent of Vladimir Putin. He's a Russian propagandist. He should be hung for treason, is what people are saying in CNN and MSBC and so on. The war has the potential to spiral out of control and involve many more countries in Europe and even further field, because virtually every country in Europe is sending high-tech weapons to 
Ukraine, including anti-tank missiles and uh, such as the Javelins, uh, which are super effective, and uh, these Stinger missiles, which are very effective in taking down aircraft and helicopters. And so Russian casualties are mounting because of Western weaponry being set, and that's not neutrality. The chances of Russia saying this is aggression, you're waging economic warfare on us, you're sending weapons that are killing our men, that this could see some retaliation. This could involve all of Europe if just one step or another is taken wrong. And remember, there's a lot of nuclear weapons involved in this. And by the way, the first thing that you see in nuclear weapons, even if it's just tactical nukes on the battlefield, is a lot of destruction. This is what a first wave of hostile nuclear missiles are projected to be like. The blue being NATO, the red being Russia. And then, of course, remember, we've got subs out there as well. And so the next stage would be huge barrages of missiles, which includes from nuclear subs in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. And that's what the third stage would look like. This is what they call MAD. Mutually Assured Destruction, M-A-D. That's what they called it during the Cold War. Insane. Ephesians 4 verse 25, Therefore, having put aside falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. By the way, you might be interested to notice, the countries that are most religious and the countries that are least religious. So the darker the red, the more atheistic. The darker the blue, the more religious. Interesting that South Africa... And Russia are amongst some of the most religious countries in the world. By the way, religion doesn't necessarily mean um, Christian. For example, India would be mostly Hindu, for example. But uh, it's just giving you a feel of who's the most religious, who's the most atheistic. How sad that you've got countries like Canada, Sweden, and China so atheistic. Hideous. How is it that the whole of Africa is considered not I don't understand that unless they didn't look at all those countries. So this could be not, they might not have looked at all 220 countries in the world. They might have just done a selection. So okay. the ones that are blank probably are ones that they weren't considering. Yes, that's correct. So, so it's, it's a limited survey. This is from the Washington Post. It's not an operation world. But I, I just think it's interesting to notice Russia is now one of the most religious countries in the world. Um, and sadly... Canada and the whole of Western Europe are pretty secular. It's sad. Now, in Russia, far and away, Christians are the majority. I mean, the, the number of, of Christians is, is huge. It's the largest Christian nation in Europe. And Ukraine has a vast amount of Christians too, huge amounts. And we need to bear this in mind. There are Christians on both sides. And where did this all start? 988 AD, Prince Vladimir, known as Vladimir the Great, or as Saint Vladimir, was baptized in 988 AD. And he was the king of the Russians, and he ordered all the Russians to be baptized. And there they were, being baptized in the Dnieper River <laughs> in Kiev. And these are some of the iconography artwork uh, celebrating this great event. 988. And this is the conversion of the Russian people and it happened in Kiev, which was his capital. And so Vladimir, the prince of the Russians, is very much part of Russian history. And in fact, Vladimir Putin is named after this prince, Vladimir the Great, or Saint Vladimir, as he's often known. And these are statues in Kiev, Kiev. And interestingly enough, in 2018, Vladimir Putin sponsored and initiated a monument to Prince Vladimir in Russia, just outside the gates of the Kremlin. And so in, and this is a huge monument. I mean, what an obvious Christian imagery. And at this particular opening event, Vladimir Putin pointed out the unity between the Ukrainian and Russian people, the same faith, the same culture. We look back to the same individual, the Vladimir. We're looking back to the same baptism, 988 as the beginning of the conversion of both our peoples, because we really want people in culture and in history and in faith, he said. And uh, this is a rallying point. And at the same message, Vladimir Putin was saying, the Orthodox faith 
is a beacon and a guidance for the future, for our morals and uh, for the country and all those sort of things. So there's no doubt that the Russian people are now becoming increasingly religious, increasingly Christian in the Orthodox tradition. And you see Prince Vladimir's sword and cross very prominent. And this really epitomizes the faith of the Russian people. Nothing indicates seriousness than a willingness to get baptized in Arctic conditions in the ice. And I have spoken to Russians who got baptized in the ice. They had to crack the ice or cut the ice so they could have their baptism. And here is Vladimir Putin undertaking a ritual Arctic ice um, baptism. He, he has been baptized before, but this is something they do each year. It's part of the Orthodox tradition. And notice he's got this cross on. He speaks in his testimony that his mother was a dedicated Orthodox Christian. His father was an atheist party man, hardcore communist party man. His mother secretly baptized him in 1952. And he was raised uh, by his mother secretly as a Christian, but he had to be an atheist openly. He had to say the atheist things, had to be a Communist Party member to get anywhere uh, in the country, and he was a nationalist. But his faith was very much his mother's faith. Until in the 1990s, his house burned down, his life was almost lost, and he had what he called a revelation and a miracle in his life, and he converted to Christ, and he hasn't ever depart from the path since then. He is recognized in the Russian Orthodox community as a dedicated Christian. In fact, the patriarch of the Russians say he is the most pro-Russian leader in history. There is not a czar that was as pro the Orthodox Church as Vladimir Putin. He's done more for them. In fact, he's funding the building of about 200 churches a year as part of compensation for the many thousands of churches that were destroyed under the Communist Party before. Notice in his cabinet room, there's not much on the wall behind him except an icon of Christ. Not our style, I mean, we reformed, but Orthodox Christians, interesting, it's not a portrait of Lenin or Marx or something like that. It's, it's an icon of Christ. And I think this is the tragedy of it. We've got Christians on both sides. It's well to remember at this time that the United States of America under Obama and Biden refused American President Vladimir Putin's proposals for Russian membership in NATO. Here you see at NATO 2002, Vladimir Putin requesting membership in NATO. So much so that they set up a North Atlantic consultation uh, agreement between Russia and NATO, and this is one of the meetings. And here's another one that they had more recently. Uh, but they always stopped short of giving Russia full NATO membership. And so here you can see it's just Russia and Belarus, and NATO's got vastly more. In fact, I think NATO outnumbers Russia militarily by something like 15 to 1 in terms of everything. For example, America's got, what, 11 or 12 aircraft carriers? Russia's got one aircraft carrier and so on. And that's not counting Britain, France and so on. So what Vladimir Putin has been pleading for for years is a neutral, demilitarized Ukraine and a restoration of minority language rights for Russians in Ukraine. Bearing in mind that there's a lot of Russians in Ukraine, and request for autonomy in Donetsk and Luhansk, and most recently request for guarantees that American missiles would not be placed in Ukraine, which seems a reasonable thing to request. Our Lord said, "You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." But now we've got war, and unfortunately, this is a war where people are suffering on the ground. There's a lot of individual courage, doubtless, on both sides. There's casualties on both sides. This is tragic. And what we are seeing is a vast amount of potential for disaster if this goes on much longer. The sooner this can end, the better. This is not going to end well. The longer it goes on, after a while in the war, there's no winners, there's only losers. And so bear in mind right now, there are meetings between representatives of Ukraine and Russia meeting in Belarus. And we can only hope and pray that cooler heads will prevail. I know what Russia's demands are because RT is repeating it. And Russia today is a useful source of information to get out of the normal source of propaganda that we get from our side. It's been cut off the TV channel. Yes, I know. We can only get it via, via, via. Um, some people are sending, you can't get it on the internet. Yeah. It's got to be emailed to you. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Russia um, 
uh, today is saying what their requests are is that Ukraine be neutral and not be part of NATO. And of course, they plan to annex the Russian majority parts of eastern Ukraine. Uh, so if Ukraine will accept neutrality and not being part of NATO and EU, they can keep the bulk of it, which is central and east, uh, central and western Ukraine. That's what they are demanding. And uh, then they will leave them alone. They're not planning to occupy the whole country or anything like that. Now, my East European friends point out that the American government is extremely hypocritical to talk about democracy. Considering the Allies betrayed 100 million Christians in Eastern Europe to Stalin's Soviet Union through the Alt Agreement in 1945. Ukraine was freed by Germany in 1917. And this independence was recognized even by Vladimir Lenin's Soviet Union in the brest litovsk Treaty of March 1918. But the Allies at the Versailles Treaty betrayed Ukraine back into the hands of the Soviet Union. And many millions of Ukrainians were slaughtered under first Lenin's and then Stalin's brutal purges. And the Kulaks were the farmers, and dekulakization was presented as land reform. The official state newspaper Pravda, which means truth, declared in order to eliminate the Kulaks as a class, the resistance of this class must be smashed in open battle. It must be deprived of the productive sources of its existence and development. Free use of the land, instruments of production, land renting, right to hire labor. That is the term towards a policy of eliminating the Kulaks, or the farmers, as a class. And this is the very unsubtle communist propaganda using the Hammond sickle to smash the caricatures of the Kulaks, or the farmers. Under this dekulakization policy, 18 million Ukrainian peasants lost their homes and their farms. Millions were deported to Siberia, and up to 11 million Ukrainians died in the massacres and result in man-made famine between 1929 and 1936. This came to be known as the Holodomor, also known as the Great Famine, Ukrainian Genocide, 1932 to 1933. The word Holodomor literally translated from Ukrainian means death by hunger, or to kill by hunger, or to starve to death. Holodomor is a compound of two Ukrainian words, holod, meaning hunger, and more, meaning plague, hunger plague. This is one of the monuments to the Ukrainian victims of Stalin's brutal starvation campaign. In 2017, the film Bitter Harvest dramatized this horror of the Soviet Holodomor in Ukraine, well worth seeing. Ukraine was again liberated by the Germans in 1941, but then betrayed by the Allies through the Yalta Agreement back into the bloodstained hands of Stalin's Soviet Union. As our friends in Ukraine and Eastern Europe point out to us, without the extravagant support of the United States and the United Kingdom and Canada, Stalin's Soviet Union could not have survived Operation Barbarossa in 1941. Even before the United States of America entered World War II officially, vast quantities of military hardware were being flown, shipped, trucked into the Soviet Union via Alaska, Persia, and Mamansk. Planes went by Alaska, weaponry went through Persia and Mamansk. The Ukrainian and Lithuanian armies continued to fight for their freedom and independence for 10 years after the conclusion of World War II, yet without receiving a bandage or bullet. Units of the Ukrainian army are still operating with field artillery and company strength, fighting against Soviet oppression as late as 1955, 10 years after the war, yet without receiving any aid from the West. As Freedom Betrayed, written by President Herbert Hoover, documents the treacherous role played by the United States under FDR in fomenting the Second World War, in escalating it, in bailing out and supporting the worst mass murdering dictatorship in the world, Stalin's Soviet Union, betraying 15 nations of Eastern Europe and Central Europe with over 100 million Christians in them to the hideous oppression of the communist Russians and the NKVD secret police. Even more than that, under Operation Keelhaul, which was sealed secret for 30 years, over 2 million Russians and a million Ukrainians in Western Europe were forcibly repatriated by British and American troops at bayonet point, many of them being shot or bayoneted or killed for refusing were forced into the hands of the Soviet NKVD, who massacred most of them out of hand, and the rest were consigned to slave labor in the Gulag Arctic hellholes of Siberia. Now, if you want a good example of an American president, how about President Teddy Roosevelt? Theodore Roosevelt, in 1905, stopped the war between Japan and Russia. In 1905, there was a hideous war between Japan and Russia, and instead of America 
being a belligerent or getting involved or aiding one or the other side. They stepped in as an honest broker and negotiated a peace, bringing an end to this pointless war. And does the actual picture of the Russian and Japanese negotiators with Teddy Roosevelt standing in the middle. And he got peace signed by the 5th of September 1905, which effectively brought peace to that part of Asia. And he won a Nobel Peace Prize for it when it still meant something. Now, that was a good use of American foreign policy. What about Henry Dunant, the man who founded the Red Cross? Now, Henry Dunant was an evangelical, Bible-believing Christian. In fact, the first thing you see when you go to the International Committee of the Red Cross Museum in Geneva, Switzerland, where I've been, is you see his Bible. And you see a whole lot of Bible verses. Heal the sick, good Samaritan, go and do likewise, whatever you did not the least, he's done unto me. A whole lot of Bible verses. I mean, this is the International Committee for the Red Cross. Because Henry Dunant is recognized worldwide as one of the best exports of Switzerland, the International Red Cross. And the Red Cross is just, it's a reversal of the Swiss flag. The Swiss flag is a white cross and red. Red Cross is a Red Cross in white. And the Red Cross has been mobilizing people in some of the worst war zones of the world in order to bring medical help to people who are suffering on all sides. Combatants, non-combatants, both sides, they don't distinguish. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if more countries followed the armed neutrality policy of Switzerland? You would hope at this time of tragic crisis war that some lessons could be learned. Meddling in other countries, sponsoring revolutions and coups to topple foreign governments can have catastrophic consequences. And this is true not only for Ukraine, but also for Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. Just think what these countries looked like before American intervention, what they looked like afterwards. Not exactly progress, but that's democracy view. The bombing of Libya by NATO, what chaos that caused. And Syria, how much suffering has been caused in Syria because of their intervention? And Iraq, yes, Iraq looked like a paradise before and it looks like an absolute hellhole now. Violating agreements, ignoring warnings can be disastrous. Abolishing minority rights for Russians in Ukraine and refusing requests for autonomy in regions for the Russian majority population was not wise. Maybe that's a lesson we could learn as well. And continuing to expand NATO and the European Union eastwards, despite repeated warnings from Russia for a very long time, was viewed as threatening Russia's strategic security. That's been reminded multiple times. In 1991, with the collapse of NATO, NATO was requested, and Gen uh, President George H. Bush, who was President at the time, and Secretary of State Baker, gave a personal assurance to Russia, Yeltsin, NATO will not take another step, not one foot eastwards. Yeah. Ukrainian forces have even been deployed to Afghanistan under UN colors, NATO colors, I should say, even though they haven't been part of NATO. They've been treated like they're part of NATO. Another lesson we could learn, what refusing the application of Russia to join NATO was, in hindsight, perhaps not the best policy. Isolating and enforcing sanctions and threatening Russia not only drove this potential ally away from the West, but forced them to make a deal with China, because where else can they go? Russia could be a powerful ally to counter the rising threat of China, but they've been forced into a corner where they've got nowhere else to go. Russia's still a phenomenal military power, second largest military power on earth after America. But still, why would we want them as an enemy when they asked to be our friend many a time? Alienating and demonizing Russia has not improved the security of NATO. Now all of NATO is in danger of getting sucked into a war, maybe even a nuclear war, as a result of this foolishness. Is that worth it? How does this improve the security of NATO? If NATO was truly defensive, we wouldn't have a problem. But NATO has not been defensive. It's been awfully aggressive since 1999 in the bombing of Serbia. American meddling in Ukraine has not improved the lives or security of, of Ukrainians. Ukrainians would have been much better off if they'd never heard of NATO and if America had never organized that 2014 coup, and you know, forget about the roses and the piano and all that other stuff back in 2014, that's just propaganda. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. Bear in mind, there are many Russian 
Christians in, in the Russian armies. These are Russian soldiers praying before being deployed. Russian Christians coming past the Orthodox priest kissing the cross in the Orthodox way. Ukrainians kneeling in the middle of Kiev praying. They're Christians on both sides. They've run out of Bibles in Ukraine. People are pleading for Bibles to come to Ukraine. They don't have enough. All the Bible shops, everything, all the shelves are empty. People are, of course, spiritually hungry at a time like this. Our missionary friends in Ukraine, we asked them, are you planning to leave? And said, how can we? This is when we need it the most. And so, for example, one of our good missionary friends, Shanna, she says they've opened up their school and home for refugees coming through. They're giving medicine, food, helping. Uh, they can't leave now. Uh, there's lines of people. There's no money at the ATMs. There's no food in the shelves in the shops. There's just, you know, no electricity in whole areas. Uh, this is the time. The church must be there. Missionaries must be there. This isn't the time to leave. You don't leave when people need you the most. These people are afraid. The people are scared. The people are confused. People are depressed. And that is the time for the church to step in. We need more missionaries to come in. Then. We need to pray. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith.